Things don't come easily to me. I never get things on the first time or the second time, more like the third or the fourth time. My parents came here as political refugees from Uganda. My father was watching television and Idi Amin, who was the dictator there in Uganda, came on and said that all of the Indians in the country had 90 days to leave the country. The United States was the only country that let them in. So my parents are probably the two most patriotic people that you will ever meet. No matter how tired my father was, every day he would come home, take out a book, put me on his lap, and read to me books that were about people who were doing good things, Dr. King or Mahatma Gandhi or Eleanor Roosevelt. And so it was these incredible like change agents. And I think that that always like really stayed with me. I always wanted to serve. I was a young woman who always knew what she wanted to do. I always wanted to serve and, and hopefully run for office. And then I woke up when I was, you know, 32 years old and realized that I was on the wrong path. I was really engaged in the 2008 presidential election. And I remember watching Hillary's concession speech and I felt like she was looking right at me. And she said, you know, just because I failed doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to. And I just kind of took a really deep look in and said, you know, what am I afraid of? And it was the best year of my life. Everything was like jumping off a cliff. I remember my first television interview was with Chris Matthews. Her name is Resma Shijani. She's a lawyer and activist. I had never been media trained before. I was terrified, but it was incredible. Well, what would you I cut? I want to give you an idea. We're, we're proposing what we call a national innovation bank. I believe that New York City has the capacity to become the city of innovation. And I lost, and lost big. Put myself in debt and maxed out everybody in my life. I felt like I had just let down so many people and sort of really thinking about, you know, as women, like, how do we feel about risk and failure, right? We live in a society that's so ashamed of failure. And so I immediately started talking about how I felt and that I was going to pick myself right back up and get back out there and meet those commitments that I had made to those constituents. We focused on teenage girls and girls who didn't have access to technology. That was really important for us. There's going to be 1.4 million jobs that are open in the next 20 years in science, technology, engineering, and math. But right now, only one out of seven engineers is a woman. And Girls Who Code wants to change that. With girls, there's not an aptitude issue. But when you ask a girl what she wants to do with her life, she says, I want to change the world. And when she closes her eyes and she thinks about what a computer scientist looks like, she sees a guy just kind of at a computer typing away. So what we do at Girls Who Code is we not only teach them the hard skills, but we expose them to technologists who are changing the world. And when they get exposed to it, they're passionate about it and they're good at it. You know, one of my young girls, Cora, her father got diagnosed with cancer. So she developed an algorithm that would help detect whether a cancer was benign or malignant. She's 15 years old. We don't even know what the world would look like if we gave girls the leverage and the power of technology. The ideas that they come up with are so different than if I was teaching a group of 20 boys, right? And all of their ideas are centered around changing the world. They'll do it, I have no doubt. I have a lot of resilience. Part of it is like if you haven't failed yet, you haven't tried anything.